My puppy was a dog man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've moved twice in the past few months, and the entire story revolves around the upright walking canid, or North American dogman. My inheritance came in this past year, and although I really wanted to buy a house, my friends urged me to rent or lease a place for a while before buying. I'm really glad I listened to them because breaking the lease on a rental is a lot less hassle than trying to sell a house that turns out to be in dogman territory. I don't really want to say where this took place because I'm still a little frightened of... Well, there, there are people who know where I moved to, so I don't want to badmouth their town in public, if you know what I mean. I grew up in Philadelphia, but I always wanted to live in the country outside the city. I had a romantic notion about the kind of people who live in the country. I thought they were kind and wise and took life at an easier pace. And I suppose some of them truly are like that. But it turns out there are just as many creepy people in the country as you'll meet in the city. Folks are the same all over. And don't let anyone ever tell you different. I should have known this house would not work out because I saw a monster while driving there the first time on my moving day. I was in my car by myself, leading the way so that the guy driving the big moving truck would know where to go. It was the morning, but it was an overcast day, almost as dark out as night. Off to the right past the road was some grass leading to a forest, and out of those trees ran the craziest looking animal I've ever seen. I jumped and screamed when I saw it, because not only was it running toward the road at top speed, but it looked like a living nightmare. This thing had a dog's head, but it ran upright, like a man. It was covered in fur and wore no clothing, so I could see it was an animal, not a human being. And yet it appeared to be a man at least, in some sense or another. It was taller than I am, and I'm six foot one. Let's say this creature man was six foot four or six foot five. Short enough that it still could have been a man in a costume, but the legs were not human. They were canine. Its front legs, granted, were far more human than canine, but the hind legs, which it stood and walked on, were like those of a dog. The chest was broad, and the thick fur was thinnest on the belly. The skin shade was light compared to the fur, which appeared gray to me in the limited lighting, but a very dark gray, almost black. The expression was fierce, as though the dog-headed man were either very seriously focused on something, or else like maybe he had a bad headache. I eased off the gas to slow down, and the creature flashed its bright glowing eyes at me, then altered its course to turn to its left. That took it behind me, possibly to run out in front of the moving truck. I hit the gas again to get away from that thing, just as I heard the truck beep once behind me. Looking in my mirror, I couldn't see the dogman any longer, and the truck seemed to still be coming on full speed. I imagined that he had beeped when the dogman almost ran out in front of his truck, and that must have been why the creature ran off. I couldn't wait to get to my new home and quiz the driver. I wanted to hear everything that he saw when the dogman ran in his direction. When we got to the house, however, the driver seemed genuinely confused when I asked him about the animal. He and his assistant should have both had clear views of the dogman, yet neither of them remembered seeing any strange animals that stood up on their hind legs. They both insisted that the reason the driver beeped that one time was because I had momentarily slowed down. So I guess they were so focused on not rear-ending me that they never noticed the dogman. Some people have suggested to me that maybe the movers lied about not seeing the monster, since many people just don't want to admit it when they've seen a cryptid, because they don't want to be thought of as crazy. 
If that was the case, though, then those movers have more talent in acting than moving. The house itself is nestled in the woods, and it feels very private when you're there. It really isn't, though, as there are neighbors also nestled in those same woods, and they know more about you than you know about them. It wasn't long after I moved in that neighbors began to drop by with gifts to welcome me to the area. I learned quickly that these people were not what I expected country people to be like. They seemed to have a lot of in-jokes that they didn't share with me. They seemed insular and unwelcoming, even as they brought you a homemade cake with the word welcome spelled out in icing on top. When they brought me food, they would insist I try some in their presence. They would study me as I took a bite, then turn to each other and giggle uncontrollably. After they left, I would flush the rest of the food down the toilet. I wasn't sure what I had been given to eat. These people looked the same as anyone else, but they acted in a manner that had me ill at ease almost all the time I lived there. Early on, I had asked two of the neighbors if they knew about any dogs that walked upright nearby, or maybe a breed of bear with heads like a wolf. They said something to each other that I didn't understand, but when I tried to quiz them further, they would only giggle. The last of the neighbors to gift me was this guy I'm going to call Satchel. Satchel has looked sunburned, and he has a big handlebar mustache. He has a habit of staring at you for 15 or 20 seconds before he speaks. It's very uncomfortable, and he knows it. Only, that seems funny to him. Satchel brought me a puppy as a gift, and he giggled even more than any of my previous visitors had. I didn't like the look on his face, or the sick way he would just stare at me and laugh, but I couldn't flush the puppy like I had the food. I kept the little dog, who was a lot of fun right from the start. I named him Jasper. He was the first dog I'd had since I was 15, and I truly enjoyed taking care of Jasper and playing with him as well. He was good at catch. He was good at frisbee. I had no idea what breed he would grow up to be, but he sort of looked to me like a dark gray German Shepherd. I don't think they make dark gray German Shepherds, though. He had pointed triangular ears like that kind of a dog, but the body build was more like a Mastiff, I guess. Or a Bulldog, too, big-chested. He looked like he was going to grow up to be something big and something strong. As soon as Jasper moved in, there started to be sightings of that same dogman around my house. It looked the same as the first one I told you about. First, my cousin Jen came over to see the new place and meet Jasper, but she seemed in a strange mood while we had lunch. She was so distracted that we finally had to directly address it. Jen admitted to me that she had seen something impossible on the way over that day. I asked her to describe it and give me all the details, and I listened without prompting her. She described driving down a block that I was familiar with, as it is and was located about five minutes away from that property I was renting. She said that the strangest-looking man in history had run out onto the road in front of her car. I asked her to describe the man, and she sat there with her mouth about to form a word for over a minute. I suspected she'd seen the dog man, but I needed her to say it. Neither of the moving men had admitted that they saw the creature, and so I had never told anyone else, including my cousin, about it. If Jen admitted that she saw a dog-headed bipedal creature, then I would know I wasn't crazy. Or at least I'd know I hadn't been hallucinating. This was very important to me personally, but I could see my cousin was going through her own internal emotional trauma concerning her sighting. I thought about what I would want to hear from me if I were her. What might encourage me to feel safe to tell my story? I told Jen honestly and sincerely that I wouldn't laugh at her or even doubt her no matter how crazy the story was because I had personally already experienced strange things in that part of the state. That seemed to embolden her, and she perked up and took it as kind of a challenge. 
You've seen something strange, have you? She asked me. Well, have you ever seen a living werewolf? Bingo. She had seen what I had seen. I didn't answer her question directly at first because I didn't want to compete with her. I only wanted to learn the facts of her sighting or encounter. I have to admit, it was a moment of elation because I had felt as though I might be losing my mind for some time. It was a relief to know that at least there was something physically real out there, which I had come across. The sense of excitement was short-lived, however, as Jen told me her story, and the fear of my own came back. The fact that this creature was actually real, and was actually prowling my neighborhood, was nothing to celebrate. This was as bad as having any other kind of killer loose in your area. Worse, in some ways, because law enforcement, generally speaking, do not believe in werewolves. Jen told me how the upright wolf ran bipedally out onto the local road in front of her vehicle. She didn't describe the manic behavior I had witnessed. It did not seem to be running all over the place. In her experience, a dog-headed, fur-covered, man-like monster walked upright out onto the road, then turned to look at her straight in her eyes. She said his eyes glowed from the reflection of her approaching headlights, and he almost seemed to be daring her to ram into him. Her first instinct was to slow down, but she could tell that thing would jump onto her car, and she wasn't sure her kids had remembered to lock the back seat doors. Jen is not the kind of person I would expect to hear this from, but she hit the gas instead of the brakes and swerved to the left behind the dogman, skidding a bit off the road as she made her way round the large, dangerous, upright carnivore. She said it was almost like someone else stronger than her took the steering wheel, and all she had to do was press down on the gas. After finishing telling me the story, she sort of fell apart emotionally, and I had to comfort her and make her stop apologizing for crying. I knew exactly how she felt, and in fact, I felt that I should be apologizing to her. I was the one who had brought her into this danger in the first place. I felt a sense of guilt that carried over into me discouraging any other relatives or friends from visiting me in that house. I would go visit them instead, and they'd bug me about when they could come out and see the new place or meet the new dog, Jasper. Another curious side effect of having a dog man prowling around is that the milkman told me I wouldn't be getting my milk till later in the mornings as he had to shift my part of his trip to the very end. He had the strangest look on his face and I suspected it was because he had seen the dog man. I wouldn't want to be driving around alone with a lot of fresh milk in the pre-dawn hours if a dog man was running around either. He never said why he had to shift my delivery schedule and I never asked him why but I saw him eyeing my dog Jasper nervously as we spoke. I believe this man's experience had already given him cynophobia. And then came the morning that the dog man came to visit me at my home and take my puppy away from me. Jasper was old enough by then to be let out into the backyard to do his business in the mornings and not have to wait until I was ready to take him walkies. This particular morning, he got me up before dawn, and I remember asking him if he was becoming a cat. I let him out in the backyard and was tempted to go right back to sleep, but then I knew Jasper might be locked out back for hours. I decided to make some instant coffee in order to keep myself awake for 15 or 20 minutes so that I could let the dog back in before taking one more little nap for the morning. Before the water even boiled, though, I heard a strange sound like as though Jasper had separated into three versions of himself. I ran out back and stood in the back doorway, looking as my eyes showed me exactly what my ears had warned me was there. Two more dogs that had to have been Jasper's siblings, and the three of them yipped and barked and chased each other and danced around. They would do this jumping up and down on their hind legs as though they couldn't be more excited. Although it was a cute scene, I also felt a sense of paranoia, unease, and dread. Something was wrong here. What exactly was happening? What had Satchel actually done when he gave me Jasper to raise and take care of? 
I called to my dog, and he looked at me with his happy face, but he didn't come running over as usual. This bothered me, and I called him again, but a little more sternly this time. A moment later, I regretted doing that, as a far larger figure came out of the wooded shadows of the back of that yard and into the relative light. It was the dark humanoid figure again. It was the werewolf that my cousin had seen. It was the creature that had caused my milk to arrive late after I was already done with my breakfast each day, and it objected to me ordering Jasper around. I suddenly noticed the family resemblance. I never would have if I didn't see them right there next to each other. I saw how Jasper's short snout would grow, how his soft fur would get tougher, how his fangs would grow all out of proportion. I could see just by looking at them there how Jasper was not an ordinary young dog. Jasper was the offspring of the monster who had been haunting me since I entered that neighborhood. I looked it in the eyes and found the eyes shine just as bright when reflecting dim house light back as it had been when reflecting the headlights of a car. I also noticed for the first time that this was a female. If the females are that large, are the males even larger? The concept of this being female had never even occurred to me before simply because of the size, but a check of her belly showed that this was no big daddy. This is a big mama, and I had been babysitting her baby. A large portion of me wanted to run inside and hide under the covers. A smaller but still large portion wanted to go outside and rescue my pup Jasper from these wild animals. But the entirety of me knew that dog no longer belonged to me. It was a lot sadder seeing Jasper leaving with his siblings and the big mama dogman that morning than I would have expected it to be. But, on the other hand, I knew I was getting off easy. She just wanted her boy back. She wasn't going to hurt me for it. Maybe she could see that he had been loved and taken care of. I don't know. I just know that I had no choice in the matter, and Jasper left with his blood relatives. I drove by old Satchel's place a few days later when this still was all fresh in my head, meaning to stop in and give him a piece of my mind. He knew what kind of creature he was placing in my care. He knew that was not an ordinary dog. Did he expect it to grow up and maul me? Or did he know that the mother dog would come around and fetch her young one away from me? Did he expect her to do me in, assuming I was the complete jerk who kidnapped her puppy instead of him? I don't know what Satch planned, but when I got to his house I never even slowed down. One look at the place gave me the creeps, and I just drove on by like I had some other place to get to. I still don't really know what that was all about, why I got that sudden rush of fear, but I did. The house looked fairly normal, a little run down, but not falling apart. Nothing too crazy about it at first glance, and yet I got the full Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibe somehow, out of nowhere, inexplicably. There's no overt reason to feel that way, and yet I'm glad I drove on past the house. I can't explain why, but I don't know that I'd even be telling you this story if I hadn't kept on driving. I think that bad vibe I got from the old witch man's satchel is what caused me to move to a neighborhood where I knew more people. It would be easy to blame the dogman, but the dogman was only following her instinct. It was the human being who was causing trouble both for her and for me. We're the species that usually causes most of the trouble, aren't we? As I grow older, I am more and more of the opinion that our entire race is psychotic. Considering that the creature I encountered made a grown woman cry and made my knees shake seeing it, its behavior in the end was far more noble than ours. This all happened only a short while back, Yet it already feels almost like something I dreamed. So many aspects of it truly were like a waking nightmare, up to and including the fact that for a short period of time, my puppy was a dog man. And now, a preview of our next episode. Dear Scary Stories NYC 
I thought it was Bigfoot, but it turns out I have a tall, scary-looking dogman stalking me on my own property. And when I leave the property, apparently, so does the strange dog-headed man. I went to spend the day in the city just to feel normal again, but even there, in the shadows, I could see him. There he was, peeking out at me, as soon as I would turn my head, of course. He would pull back into hiding. That's Monday right here on The Dogman Show. Channel members can expect a new uncensored video tomorrow, Sunday night on our secret channel. See you then. Whether it's hot out or if it is chilly, whether you're strong or heel of Achilles, even if you're from the Netherlands Antilles, you still aren't as badass as dear Mary Gillies. Please join us in thanking Mary Gillies for making this episode possible. In exchange, she gets to see our secret uncensored stories, as well as our Werewolf Wednesday secret previews. And you can too, just by joining our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or by joining our channel memberships by clicking the join link under this or any of our videos. And now, here's international spokes dog Henry Lee Dogman to fill in any deets I may have left out. Hank? Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck 50 at peterbernard.com and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email, as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, we'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 le That's 804 537 2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back, and we can piece it together on our end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.